So, uh, hi everybody, welcome to an offline Quantox. Uh, this was arranged on a very short notice. I'm really happy that we have so many people here today. Uh, and it's also a real pleasure to introduce Pramir Padia. He's an assistant professor at Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue. Before joining Purdue, Pramir was a postdoctoral uh, scholar in the Physics and University Astronomic Department sorry, uh, at uh, UCLA. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from IIT Kharagpur in 2009 and master's and PhD in electrical uh, engineering department from UCLA uh, in 2011 and 2015 respectively. His research uh, has uh, explored the theory of classical and quantum synchronic phenomenon and their device applications enabled by electrical and thermal control of magnetism. Along with his teammates, uh, this work has resulted in one of the earliest demonstrations of current induced room temperature skirmion manipulations, spin torque switching by topological surface states, and quantum sensing of spintronic phenomena. He is a recipient of NSF Career in 2020, which is a very prestigious award. Um, Purdue Outstanding Engineering teaches, uh, Teacher and Ruth and Joel Spira, Outstanding Teacher of Words. Um, he's, today, he's going to talk to us about hybrid. Uh, Thanks very much for the introduction and uh, thanks very much for organizing. Yeah. yeah, is it better now? Okay. Better now? Let's try it. Hello, hello. This, this oh, I don't think the mic is working. Yeah. Hello, hello. Now it's working. Now it's working. Better now, but yes. Okay. Oh. oh. Yeah, maybe I'll just speak loud. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. Mic is not actually connected. Yeah. Mic is not connected. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Let's get started and speak louder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just speak loud. Uh -huh. Right. So thanks again for on a very short notice uh, getting this arranged. Uh, so, so basically today I want to talk about uh, this sort of a recent emerging direction of hybrid quantum spintronics. Uh, most of uh, our work is done at Purdue University and as part of this uh, quantum science center, which is led by Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, this is a very collaborative effort, so I should first begin by just acknowledging uh, all the people who really did this work. I'm just more like a messenger here. Sorry for the type setting, it was meant in uh, in keynote, but you have to track the PowerPoint so they might be sometimes setting. I apologize for that. But uh, the most of the work that has been done here is uh, all the theory work was done by postdoc in my group, Avinash uh, Mushfikar, and uh, an undergraduate intern. He was an undergraduate interning us from IIT Bombay. And uh, all the experiments that I will be presenting, most of that work will be that was done by a uh, student of Sheikh so like in my group. And this collaboration was across various different universities as part of uh, these various funding research agencies. So, so that's uh, basically the uh, acknowledging part, but now I should start by just to bring in the context, what is this hybrid quantum spintronics that I want to talk about? Let me start by presenting the following view of the field of spintronics, where uh, the basic idea is to harness the spin degrees of freedom for creating, eventually creating new forms of memory, computing, communication, and sensing, or, and or metrology technologies. And uh, in the community, this has been done uh, traditionally in two different parts. So in one part, uh, people have focused on what I'm calling here as a macros macroscopic limit, where there's a bunch of spin, the classical magnetic, uh, where the, the spin basically behaves like a classical vector. And in this case, people have discovered different kinds of building blocks, all the way from nanoscale magnets to interesting non-topological textures, as well as spin excitations. 
but these are all really just classical magnets, uh, ground states and their excitations, and uh, various phenomena to control the spin degree of freedom via various knobs such as mechanical, thermal, electrical, and optical means. And utilizing these uh, phenomena that have been discovered in, let's say, last uh, few decades, people have tried to map uh, this, these uh, discoveries onto different forms of memory computing and communication. The main uh, advantage these systems brings over the present day, let's say, microelectronic charge based technology is that you can, in a very small form factor, uh, create functionalities for which, for example, you would want to create the same functionality and charge based system, you would require thousands of basic elements because that just abstracts the physics out to zero and one. On the other hand, here you're utilizing the intrinsic physics and mapping it onto the uh, various kind of paradigms. A classic example of this is uh, is the so-called spin transfer clock memory devices, where uh, uh, the fact that the magnet you can create an energy barrier such that it can have this energy barrier stable for almost 10 years. You can create memories out of it very easily. And with the discovery of electrical manipulation of those bits, you can start creating uh, computing technology and things like this. So that's very much in the realm of research right now. On the other hand, you can also make this barrier very, very tiny, and you can create a very probabilistic fluctuating width, and that can be mapped onto various kind of neuromorphic or emerging uh, uh, computing technology. So that's that's the realm of why people are kind of interested in these systems. On the other hand, on the other extreme, people have also looked at somewhat independently on the in the microscopic limit where uh, the spin really, as we know, is a quantum mechanical object. It behaves like a quantum bit. If I just uh, take a single spin, it behaves like a quantum bit. And then uh, people similarly have discovered various phenomena in order to stabilize, or, or I should say stabilize, meaning that preserve its quantum properties up to room temperature inside uh, a host lattice, which is well, which protects these bits very well. So for example, here's an example of nitrogen vacancy center that is created in diamond where if you, this defect center's host uh, spin spins which can be protected from the environment and can show robust quantum properties even up to room temperature. And then people have also come up with ways to manipulate these spins so that they can, again, utilize, add the feature of quantum coherence and entanglement to all these different applications. And then recently, as you know, there's a big push to use, utilize these things to create quantum technologies, which also focus on using quantum properties to make memory computing and sense. What uh, this particular talk's focus is on uh, to bring your notice to one of the recent emerging directions where the advancements within both of these fields will be merged together to create new functionalities and or help advance uh, the respective technology, solve challenges within each of these fields. And this is what I mean by hybrid quantum spintronics. And I would like to give this as a message, main message that by merging, marrying the advances that have been made in these two respective branches, now people are looking at uh, different kind of phenomena that merges these two advances. And to illustrate this, I will take a specific example of I take from the microscopic world these nitrogen vacation centers and integrate them with the classical macroscopic magnets, but looking at the dynamical modes of these magnets and create these hybrid structures. The reason why one wants to create this, and those are the two main messages that I want to give, is on one hand, these microscopic bits or spin qubits over here, they give rise to new probes of understanding the excitations in these magnetic materials. There are various challenges that traditional probes cannot fill with, but these uh, NB centers have come up as new probes of probing the excitations within this macroscopic system and help advance the macroscopic side of the spectrum that I mentioned. And here I'll take three examples to show how uh, specifically deliver this particular message. Now, I might not have enough time to go over the second message. The other message that I wanted to deliver was somewhat reciprocal of this. That is the advancements that people have made in controlling these uh, excitations that can now be used to control the spin qubits because the spin qubits to create technologies out of them you need to manipulate these spin qubits and it turns out that uh, for these kind of NB center based spin qubits they are not uh, the create very local drives to entangle two of these qubits it remains a big challenge currently and these macroscopic excitations of magnets can provide novel control fields and mediators that can give that can potentially solve this challenge. So those two works are addressing that very part. So, but I'll prob probably be focusing most of my talk on the first first message. I'm very happy to talk about this second one also. Okay, so in, this is the first example that we'll take a look at. Uh, in this particular example, uh, the main uh, uh, main problem statement that we were solving was the following. So now, as I mentioned, these magnets have just spin wave like excitation, which uh, we know as magnons. And now people are trying to utilize these magnets as information carriers to create dissipation-less uh, 
transport, so meaning very low dissipation transport because these spin currents, when they flow in these magnetic information, that they don't have the associated junity with them. So as a result, people are very interested in utilizing these as information carriers and create technologies uh, out of them. So that's the main goal over here. Uh, the, <clears throat> and in order to create such spin currents of these magnets, what one needs to create is very similar like what we do, do for charge uh, based electronics. We need to create non-equilibrium conditions to make this current flow. And there are various ways people are looked at to create these non-equilibrium drives for these magnet currents. One of them is this microwave drive. Another is so-called spin injection where you uh, locally inject spin currents inside this magnet and that can convert into these magnon spin currents and flow out. And the third thing has been thermal gradients. If you apply thermal gradients, there can be deep current flow that these magnons carry and that can also give rise to these magnon currents. So all these various kinds of ways people have come up with creating uh, these kind of uh, non equilibrium conditions. But really to probe what is the non equilibrium condition created, can you measure a quasi uh, chemical potential of these magnons that should generate a non equilibrium chemical potential? How do you measure that? Uh, the fact that these are charged neutral excitations, I cannot just hook up my voltmeter and measure these things. So as a result, people have, want to create techniques to measure locally, for example, probe what is the magnon chemical potential inside the system. So that's the challenge in this. Uh, that was the challenge in this electronics field. And what I'll show is these kind of spin defects that I was showing in the beginning are, uh, are very nice probe for proving these things. What type of system? Is that these are ferromagnets. So a typical example of a concrete system is yttrium iron garnet. That's a magnetic insulator. So typically people are interested in magnetic insulators because again, they don't want to have charge dissipation or to avoid charge dissipation or fire so It's a ferromagnetic You're also looking at anti ferromagnetic So here the magnet, all that is, is, is a lot out of plane with these excitations? So, so this, this could be out of plane or in plane, but so in ground state is like out of plane or ground state is in plane, and then you create excitation on top. So for example, one of the examples I'm showing here is out of plane magnet. So uh, I mean, what, yeah. what's the length scale we're talking about? Here? Of uh, these chemical potential decay? Yeah, or like the wavelengths of these. Right, right. So so these could vary. These are typically a micron size. Micron size. Yeah. Length scale. But they can even reach hundreds of nanometers. So, so the reason I'm asking is key, what is the, uh, the limit to which you can push this? Yeah. In terms of density and so on. Right, so create if you so for here the kind of applications that people have in mind are more like wave based computing. So you use waves and interference of waves and create some of technology with it. And that the size of this thing is governed by the wavelength of these devices. So you would there are two goals. One goal is to, to have the spin information flow as long distance as possible. Another goal is if we create really nanoscale, we want to excite nanoscale wavelengths. So they do go through the excitations, but exciting them is a is challenge we can create. These magnets are the or these are the uh, So these, uh, these, these are typically gaps. These are in gigahertz frequency, and these particular ones. But depending on systems, you can have uh, various kind of gaps. And in fact, I'll come to some of these. Things. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the main goal then, what we demonstrated in this work was uh, uh, that these NV centers or spin qubits are an excellent probe of these chemical magnet spin qubits. That's the main message that I want to give. And I'll do that. Uh, let me just briefly introduce these centers. So these NB centers are a, a diamond lattice, and you have a nitrogen. If one of these carbons is replaced by nitrogen, and one of these carbons is a vacancy, so that's where the name NB comes from. And the NB center that uh, we are interested in is negatively charged. So you also ionize these NB centers. So it's NB minus center to be precise. Uh, this particular system uh, effectively behaves like a spin one system. So. Here's the, the, the energy diagram level spacing of this spin one defect center, where it's a spin one center. It turns out the triplet uh, manifold is the ground state, and the singlet manifold or the spin one center is the excited state. So these are the spin degrees of freedom, but then these electrons are trapped inside this. So there are orbital degrees of freedom also. So you have orbitally excited states. The, the nice thing that uh, these centers have, they are optically active. That is, there are dipole allowed transitions between the orbital states. So you can shine light and it fluoresces. The amount of light it fluoresces, that really depends on the state of the system. So that's really nice aspect of these defect centers. If the center is in plus minus one state, it fluoresces less light. But if it is in the state zero, it fluoresces more light. This is just because of how the optical, uh, the different bands are connected optically. So as a result of that, you can read out what is the spin state of this system just by looking at the fluorescence that, that is coming out of the system. 
At the same time, the same phenomenon also allows you to initialize this uh, spin defect into its ground state. Because if you keep on shining green light on this, this, this particular state, if it's in plus minus one manifold, it goes up and then it's connected to the singlet and it can come down to zero state. On the other hand, if it is in the state zero, it just keeps cycling up and down. So as a, right, as a result, if I keep shining green light, you can transfer the population from plus minus one into the zero state. So that's how you can optically initialize the system into a state, a state zero, and at the same time read what is the state of this optically. So that's the sort of one nice aspect of uh, these uh, spin defects. Now, uh, this being a spin, uh, it couples to magnetic fields. So you can create Zeeman interaction on top of this uh, intrinsic band structure or level diagram. And as a result of that, uh, this, this, if the, you apply external magnetic fields, it causes shifts in these levels, it causes transitions. If the field is transfers to these uh, NV axis, it causes transitions between the two. It can be absorbed, this microwave. The frequency turns out to be for this splitting that's governed by the zero field splitting, which is an intrinsic property of this NV center. It is in gigahertz uh, frequency range. So you can absorb gigahertz uh, radiation, or you can, uh, uh, by applying field along the NV axis, you can cause splitting between plus minus one states. So as a result of these states being moving, you can apply uh, various kind of uh, already developed uh, protocols for sensing what is the strength of these fields by looking at how it, these levels are changed by applying external magnetic fields. And the way you will actually do an experiment is by just optically reading out uh, these things. Sorry. Right, so they, they are. So right now we don't have so plus minus one states are getting connected to, and that's. I'm assuming that will come with a signal plus minus. Right. That way, the other thing which said state has to be a spin zero state. Right, so actually they, they do preserve spin. So these are linearly polarized that it can do it. So you don't really need to provide. So these optical transitions don't change the spin, uh, spin degrees of freedom in this particular center for that. So these well, so uh, doing that, so you, it will probably you know take the sigma plus component of the linearly polarized light to do that transition, right? Right. So, so these are uh, these so are spin. Was, how is it possible that you know both plus minus one as well as the other one the spin zero both are connected to optical state? So these are all spin preserved spin preserved transitions. So these are just dipole uh, dipole transitions which don't change the spin degree. I think it's, I mean, the question I think is that, okay, if it is in plus one, how does eventually it ends up at zero? Oh, so if it is plus one, you cause, first optically you cause a transition to plus one in the second state, but then there are phonons, there are the spin orbit coupling inside mm -hmm. the system. You lose that spin and come to this signal. Yeah, no, but an excited state is not one state. No, but photon is a spin one particle, right? It has to be either plus one or minus one, right? Well, uh, plus one, two, this is just, Typically D dot E coupling. So I'm not imparting any angular momentum from sport for talks. Yeah. I think or say the orbital excited state is just a it might have like different multiple states for yes. yeah. Yes. 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 yeah. yeah. So that is what is called right. So essentially you need to so you are interested to detect the P and stuff. Yeah, so, so you will be seeing some frequencies shift because of because of external state, there's a frequency shift, or there's another thing is just the uh, if there's some noise, a transverse magnetic noise that is generated, that will change the relative uh, relaxation rate of these things. You can initialize, for example, you can initialize the state in the state zero and just watch it relax. How fast it relaxes, that has the information of noise. So that those are various protocols. The one, the noise protocol is the one that we will be using here, and I'll come to that as the main relaxation. Just for yeah. question. So just to clarify, you were saying the so just like some crystalline environment, like everything, all the empty centers are the same orientation. Or oh, yes, there are four are... four possible orientations in this uh, because of those four other things. So there are four possible orientation. You typically use an ensemble also. So then mm -hmm. then you use you can detect fields along four different axes. You can also use single empty centers where you can detect that that can you can do full vector magnetism. So it's all possible to do uh, full data for direction out. So now uh, with with this centers, the, the so the main thing is now they can detect magnetic fields. We can detect them optically, and uh, the idea is now you have any target material. 
you would place them in uh, proximity to that target material. The fact that uh, now the Zeeman the target material, what you're detecting is really just the magnetic fields coming out of these target materials, and that can have information about the ground states you want to detect or the excitations you want to detect. And then nice degrees of freedom you can vary is this distance of this. So you can put this NV pitch on an AFM, and you can vary the distance of these uh, centers. So that gives rise to, and this being an atomic defect, you can get up, up to nanoscale resolution of these uh, excitations or uh, textures inside this material. The magnetic field that you can detect can vary from DC up to gigahertz because that's the noise up to the noise level governed by the splitting of these centers. So you can detect from DC to gigahertz. They, these NB centers remain uh, robust. On, uh, they have these quantum properties. They maintain their quantum properties and fluorescence right from cryogenics to room temperature. So you can apply this technique across this whole temperature range. And it is in some sense non-invasive. That is, this, the spins, the magnetic fields that these spins produce is very tiny. And they don't perturb the state that you want to measure. Of course, there's perturbation from optics that can come in, which is uh, which uh, one has to particularly care about when you go to cryogenics. So, but apart from that, it's it's sort of non-invasive technique. So, those are the nice advantages these end center sensing will bring. And it, how close will you bring? Uh, you can bring it up to tens of nanometer. So that's uh, uh, typical sizes because it, it turns out that if you place this end center very close to the surface, there. Of these NB diamond, diamond lattice, they're dangling bonds and that kind of decovers uh, the NB cycle. So, so you can, the typical limits like 25 nanometer, what we can say. And then uh, this technique has been used across various different sensing magnetic fields out of various different kind of materials. For example, here a vortex was imaged in superconductors, here the current flow was imaged inside 2D materials. And in this material, in this uh, study, a spin texture was imaged. A nice review article, I think this one is very nice review article. Which uh, details all these techniques uh, that is used for any centers for detecting material problems. <laughs> the one protocol again that I want to highlight here, which I will be using here in this particular study, is the so-called relaxometric protocol, where uh, where the idea uh, is essentially any noise that is coming, which is transfers to this NV spin axis, it will cause transitions between the two levels, uh, which we drew. Here, for example, the level zero and one, and this is typically in gigahertz, and that can cause relaxation uh, between uh, these two levels. So now, the uh, typical protocol that is used is you come in, uh, come in with a green light, initialize the system into the, its state, a non equilibrium state of zero, and then just leave it. And as the system is relaxing, uh, you then read out uh, this what is the state, either is it zero or one, and then get an idea of how soon the system relaxes, and you get typical curves like these. In fluorescence, where if you start from zero state, you relax to a thermal equilibrium, which is almost like an equal population here, and you start from one and you again relax to that thermal equilibrium state. How fast you relax, the relaxation time has uh, the knowledge of the spectral density of the noise that is resonant with these NV centers. That's basically why the Fermi Golden Rule you can just connect uh, the spectral density of noise at this frequency via the relaxation time. So that technique is what I'll be referring to as a relaxometry. So here the so noise in the magnetic field fluctuates. Noise, noise in the magnetic field sensed by this NV. Yeah. And this magnetic field, you said because of this mag noise. Because of various, whatever the environment. We will be using it for mag noise, but whatever the environment. In this context, you are using the mag noise. Sorry. Are you uh, plotting in the, uh, some form of the correlation function? Some plot of fluorescence? It's a fluorescence. Fluorescence as a function of time. So if it was in zero state, uh, and it's sort of a reverse fluorescence, one minus that. So if zero state it was fluorescing more, but so that starts from lower value and then goes to a thermal equilibrium. If this is thermalized, you will have a, a sort of equal population of zero and one because this gigahertz at room temperature will have equal population. And then uh, this will, the net fluorescence will be coming from both of these states. So that's the value here. It always reaches to thermal equilibrium value, but the starting point can be either you can initialize in zero and one more thing I didn't mention that you can also initialize in state one. The way you do that is first you initialize in zero by green light, by shining green light, and then shine a microwave of five pulse, sort of five by two pulse, uh, sorry, five pulse and rotate it. The one state. Yeah, one. The that's a or that's a distraction? Oh yeah, so uh, this is mostly here. It's just a distraction. I just want to show here. This this is a B external is the field applied along the it's a constant constant field applied along. Yeah, so you must have larger precision, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, 
Right. right, so decoherence is coming from two things. So there are two types of decoherence you can track. Here I'm talking about the so-called T1 time, so the relaxation time. So where which is governed by the transverse fluctuation so that has to have a matrix and collect connecting these two. Now you can also have fluctuations along the heavy axis, and that can cause uh, the phase decoherence, the T2 time. And one can use T2 uh, also measure how T2 is changing to measure that. that That's it. Uh, all right, so then with that background, let me come to the experiment that was done here. So again, remember the goal was to measure the chemical potential of these magnons that are uh, in this particular experiment, uh, we took yttrium uh, uh, iron carbonate, that's the magnetic insulator, and it was excited by a uh, microwave strip line. So this microwave strip line is the non equilibrium drive that uh, will create some non equilibrium population of these magnons. It turns out that in it, the magnon magnon interaction is strong enough such that you equilibrate to some thermal uh, uh, equilibrium with some finite chemical potential. And then once you have that magnon chemical potential, we want to measure that magnon chemical potential. And in order to do that, we place an MB center in proximity to this MB center. And the basic physics that's going on here is, is the following, that the MB center defects are placed such that uh, their, their splitting, that's the frequency, the gap that I was showing for the two levels, that's the one of the levels, uh, or the zero to plus minus one, zero to plus one, sorry, zero to minus one and zero to plus one, that's the splitting, and this is the magnon band, all this dispersion of magnons that is there inside this film that shown. And we place it such that the magnon band dispersion is, it cuts, so the level splitting cuts these magnon bands in this case. And as a result, if I think, if I look only at this minus state, which was the zero to minus one transition, its relaxation rate will be governed by whatever is the magnon density here, because that thermally populated magnons will cause the noise and will cause the decay of this, uh, these energy centers, and that is what will govern the relaxation rate. Now, if I look at the plus level, there is the relaxation rate will be governed by the magnon density at that particular uh, spreading. Now, but that is the situation when there is no drive applied. Now, if I come in and apply some microwave drive, as I mentioned, this creates a non equilibrium population of magnons, which can be modeled as a uh, lifting the uh, chemical effective chemical potential of these magnons, and that changes the population of magnons at the, which is resonant with the NB center. So as a result, the rate of relaxation of uh, these NB centers will change as a function of drive. And this is what we want to measure. Now, this can be calculated. This is what uh, by the typical Fermi Golden Rule. It's the rate of relaxation at a particular frequency is just governed by the number of magnons at that frequency. Uh, this is the density of states of magnon. This is the population. If I calculate the total number of magnons which are resonant, that, that gives rise to the uh, relaxation rate. Now, this relaxation rate is also a function of chemical potential because the population will be changed by changing this uh, chemical potential over here. So this N over here is just the usual uh, uh, Rayleigh genes factor, which is KT over H bar. What's the frequency of the drive? Uh, so drive frequency, we drive it at the this, this frequency, which is the lowest mode, which is fMR mode of the magnet, the ferromagnetic yes. resonance. Yeah, so when, when you so usually these are bosons. So yeah. what do you mean by that? Right, right. So that's a, a, so a, a pass for set. Okay. Second, when you say it's resonant, you are talking about some micro that absorbs uh, yeah. some that, that the angular, angular momentum is absorbed by your uh, that yeah. so let me actually answer both of them. So so right, so these are bosons. So what is the chemical potential? So these are so these are basically a quasi equilibrium situation where what we are doing is we are populating the magnons, we are just pumping energy into them and creating a large bunch of magnons, and they are interacting with each other to sort of quasi thermalize. This is not always true, it's not guaranteed to happen, but if this happens in this system, it turns out that, that it does happen because we could describe it via the process of a chemical potential. But so you should really think of it as a quasi equilibrium situation, where I'm describing them by some the population of these magnons that still be described by a boson point, but just change the factor of me. That's what is meant here in the non situation. For the other question for absorption, uh, it's really this, so each of these magnons, you can think of them, these uh, excitations create uh, external magnetic fields because they are, uh, so now these magnetic fields are at the frequency of these C magnons. Now, if the frequency of that particular magnon matches the splitting, then it causes transition. And you destroy what? You destroy magnon, you just, it's like a scattering event, you can think of. Magnon is absorbed by the MB, it causes splitting.
this is just right, so that's just for schema case. Typically, in this material, the band structure could be very complicated. It could go have a maxima and go to minima and go like this, or it could be parabolic, or it could be very different. So here you are talking about. So what's the length scale of so here it's really film. So E is really like a film. So it is uh, all, all sort of wavelengths are populated. Uh, the uh, the main wave vector that really matters here is governed by the how much distance the epicenter has from the film. So which is really a very very tiny number with respect to like standard let's say two pi by right. So it is it is it is so each of these wavelengths have some uh, uh, matrix element between them. Of course, the one which is one over D roughly has a maximum matrix element, but uh, it, it is actually a very gentle function. So if you uh, actually calculate what the magnetic field each of these magnets produces, and it has a filter function which is peaked at one over D, but it is a sort of a gentle function of one over D. What really matters is frequency matching in this case. Frequency is a very sharp filter. In this case. So, so really, what the nice thing one can do is uh, you can vary the distance, pick the wavelength, and the frequency uh, should be picked by the splitting. So you can kind of have a spectrometer where different wavelengths and frequencies can be mapped, can be sensed. A density of state of microns doesn't matter. It does matter, yeah. So at that particular frequency and wavelength, you have density of states of microns. You can measure that. That is really the experiment that we made. It's for 2D or what? So that's for wavelength dispersal. That wavelength dispersal. Right. For your case, how the density will vary? So, uh, so in this case, it is a uh, it's 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 Thick. It has some finite thickness. There's some finite thickness somewhat between 2D and 3D for uh, typical magnets. It's, uh, it's usually, you, you, again, you can calculate it's, it's not constant, but it's a bit easy. Okay, so, so that's essentially the experiment. So you can then, but the nice thing comes out of this is what you can look at the relaxation rate. If you just take the ratio with zero chemical potential and finite chemical potential, this part remains fixed. And just looking at measuring the rate of relaxation. In the presence of drive and in the absence of drive, you can extract the chemical potential out of it, the magnetic chemical potential out of it. So that is a direct measurement of magnetic chemical potential by just looking at the noise, which was not possible previously. So that's the sort of the main punchline here. And again, you can go ahead and uh, theoretically we went ahead and calculated effectively what this chemical potential will be using a simple model in this particular case. I mean, I don't want to go into various details, but the essential physics is the following that if I'm driving this FMR mode, these FMR modes, uh, because of non-linear interactions within the system, it is not a linear system. So as a result, if I'm drawing, driving this FMR mode, it pumps magnets. It's, uh, all these magnets are connected to it. We create populate the extra high frequency magnets, and then uh, this there's a parameter that governs that uh, that coupling. That parameter is eta. So based on that eta parameter, which is one fitting parameter. And for a given drive, you can calculate. So this drive is pumping magnons, and these magnons are then getting lost to the phonons in the background. You can balance the rate and create what effective chemical potential you create. And that's how you can create this. So you have an experiment and a theory for this view for a given drive, and then you can go ahead and compare. And this is exactly what was done in this experiment, where uh, this is the same relaxometry protocol. What is being shown is the relaxation rate for the minus center, that is zero to minus one transition, as a function of external magnetic field, you can vary this as a parameter or the drive as a parameter, and you generate uh, these kind of relaxation. These are the experimental measurements of relaxation rate. You can convert them into a chemical potential by the formula I just mentioned, uh, by looking at with drive and without drive, and that's the chemical potential that is generated for the same same set of parameters. The nice thing that we uh, one sees that we are indeed measuring something like a chemical potential. And this relates back to the question. Is the fact that as soon as this chemical potential keeps rising, 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 it gets pinned at the bottommost of the band. So as a result, I can change the value of this bottommost band by applying an external magnetic field. If I keep on driving, there's an effective chemical potential you create. It rises, rises, rises. It cannot enter the band. That's because being these being both on, so you cannot have some sort of a Fermi energy of these. So it creates and comes and just pins at the bottommost band. And this bottom of the band can be moved by applying external magnetic field. And always, what we saw experimentally, it always went ahead and got pinned near the bottom of the band in this experiment. And then finally, we compared it with the theory expression that we just uh, I just mentioned as a function of external magnetic field. And it's, uh, with just one fitting parameter, it did fit all the expectations we want uh, we had. So based on this, uh, you sort of concluded that what we were measuring indeed in this case was a chemical potential. So that's the 
let's get this show. Yes. So why not? Are you doing the same experiment like measure is T2, seeing it at a certain right level, T gets modified by right. right. That would give you the omega space, right? Correct, right, correct. Right. So you could you could also do a T2 relaxing method. So and people do that. So in this one, we were mostly just trying to extract the chemical protein, which naturally came out of the relaxed gradient for people to do it. So that's why you're looking at the T1 type of relaxation. But one could also do T2. Express that uh, one cannot derive the dispersion. Uh, so dispersion of uh, meaning you want to measure, you know, measure the dispersion of one. I mean, from D sector directly can can we say that one can measure dispersion? Yeah, you could derive properties of one on dispersion. So, for example, uh, what is the density of states as you are varying? But yeah, so these kind of things can be done now. So this time, so this one, a single atmosphere. Can come from many different directions. Right. So I'll basically have the DK average is the basic yeah. right. That's right. That's exactly right. Oh, sorry. So in the uh, in the second experiment, what I want so I hope one thing I want I could convey in this uh, experiment here is now these are really, really nice sensitive probes that you can use them as a spectrometer of uh, whatever excitations in different target material, uh, which was sort of missing for at least magnetic insulators. This community. Now, in the second experiment, uh, this, this is more a theory proposal that we had, where we were looking at uh, now anti ferromagnets, where uh, the, there's another push in the spectronics community of using anti ferromagnets rather than ferromagnets. The reason being, this anti ferromagnets, the dynamical modes of these anti ferromagnets are governed by exchange interactions between this, in this magnet, and those exchange interactions are about two orders of magnitude stronger than uh, the usual ferromagnets, so they are very fast. They are about terahertz type of frequency range, these magnet sliders. The second nice thing that do, they do is because of these anti alignment, they don't produce large straight fields outside of these magnets. So, as a result, you can uh, compactly pack uh, different elements together without disturbing each one, one, one with the other. So, that's that's the reason why people are looking at ferromagnets. But the problem is the same thing the traditional probes that are used for ferromagnets become very challenging to use for anti -parameters. For example, there's an anti texture and you want to image that anti texture. The, the traditional probes, which let's say a um, uh, magneto-optic curl effect or an MFM type of measurement, which measures this, either the stray fields that come out of this or uh, the net magnetic moment inside the material, those kind of things become more challenging to be adapted for anti -parameters. And that's why the progress in anti is, uh, is people are always looking for new tools to probe these anti systems. And here again, uh, the goal for us was, can we come up with a scheme to measure the spin textures in anti magnets using these energy centers again? And the answer uh, that we came up with is, the technique that we proposed is to not look at just the straight field, but again, look at the noise that comes out of these anti magnets. Because whenever there is dynamics in the anti magnet, that does produce straight fields inside this magnet. And uh, the, the nice thing that, uh, because of the frequency scales that enter here, uh, is that you can image domain walls or the spin textures very easily in these anti -parameters. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. So the picture that I'm showing here is an anti insulator with on one side uh, the, the so-called nail vector, which is the difference in the two sp sub spins, is pointing up, and then the nail vector changes to the opposite side. And this, so that's a domain wall in an anti -paramagnet. And what we want to image is where does this domain wall lie? And the idea that we were proposing here is to use these ND centers and just scan these domain walls and look at the noise or the relaxation rate. Again, do a relaxometry experiment on these ND centers. Now, these type of things, just to say that, uh, that these are not uh, just a theoretical construct, these type of things exist. People have used these uh, ND centers inside an AFM tip and they have used to actually image hard disks, for example. And this is an experiment, one of the first experiments that did this. So you can put this on top of AFM tip and do these kind of experiments. Uh, so now, then here's the main uh, thing that why we can image this domain wall within this technique is whenever we are on top of the domain, which is uh, then the noise that is coming, we are probing is the spectrum in that domain region. And in that domain region, the, the frequency as I just mentioned, the space frequency, the gap that I was mentioning in the previous pyramid insular, that gap itself is terahertz because this because the exchange interaction is so strong. So then, as a result, here all the magnetic noise is above terahertz, and don't this emission does not couple these anti-ferromagnets, and it does not relax very well. 
on top of this domain region. So that's the gap that is mentioned, and it's on the order of hundreds of gigahertz. On the other hand, when this NB center is on top of a domain wall or spin texture, this domain wall is a soft mode of this material. Because you can imagine that I can just, just displace this domain wall to a different location. Uh, the energy of this system does not change. There will be some pinning, but that pinning is what is governing now the, the, the frequency of oscillations of these domain walls. On the other hand, in, inside the domain region, it's really very high frequency oscillation. So as a result, these, in fact, if, there's, if you neglect pinning, then these domain walls I can place anywhere without causing any energy change in the system. And so they are gapless. They are gapless modes that lie within these domain walls that remain. So there, there are these sort of goals and modes of these uh, domain walls that exist. So as a result, now if I scan an NB center, on as soon as it's near this domain wall, it will have a spectral density of noise present, and you can that that will cause a relaxation of this NB center. But on the other hand, if it's on top of the domain, then it cannot see uh, any noise. And the, when constructing a T1 map, all the domain walls should lit up. Basically, that's the idea. And uh, very recently, uh, basically, uh, experiments performed in Jack's group. Vincent Jacks was on a synthetic antiferromagnet, so they created an antiferromagnet here, uh, demonstrated this experiment with this proposal, where they saw that the basic system here is, uh, again, there are two and two ferromagnet regions coupled via an antiferromagnetic exchange interaction. So that's an RK, uh, that's the typical system that's used in spin transfer talk memory devices. So they use this to show proof of principle of this experiment, where they created a synthetic antiferromagnet, and then using an enemy AFM tip, they scanned the, these systems, and whenever the system was near a domain wall, the demon time tank down. On the other hand, whenever it was on top of the domains, the demon time was large. So they could uh, sort of create these beautiful images of uh, domain walls, uh, skirmions, or spin textures inside this antiferromagnet, utilizing this, uh, this thing. So I hope that also sort of provides another example where uh, you could use these enemy centers for probing something which was not possible previously in the absence of. Uh, so, so this domain wall exercise is very similar to cavity cavity exercise. So, cavity is very similar to that. Uh, it is somewhat different. So it is really uh, on top of a spin texture. So it's really displacements of domain walls. So think of it like you can have string-like displacements of domain walls. So it can move uh, like this, or it can have some wavelength of excitation around that motion. Also, these are spins. So the spins inside these domain walls can also rotate. So there is a if you have a so-called easy access antiferromagnet, which is work, so then there's a UL symmetry in the easy access magnet. So the spin can just rotate. So then there's a, another mode associated with spin rotations, and there's a mode with motion. Those were the two modes that I showed. So that's asking this here, same thing. We have this counted and right. So that is a different expression. Right, so so gapless magnets, uh, all you need is it, as long as you have UL symmetry in your system. In that system, the unit comes from a different origin because it's like, it's like a candid anti fermenter rotation and you can rotate it without changing. Here, it's a somewhat different from that, but yeah, the gap is origin. Is there any topological feature of these domain walls that we have this uh, inversion of the vector? Real vector? Right, right, so there's one question that has always been people is so there are these modes now that is given uh, that exist, gapless modes exist at these boundaries. Now, could that be also thought of as on one side you have positive gap, on the other side you have a negative gap? So that imprints a uh, gapless mode. So that connection might be very really be It's a similar to bilayer of you know, right. ABPS stacking on the Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 So so that connection might very really exist. Can can the NB center probe anything of that type of yeah. behavior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's an interesting question. So, so all it probes is a magnetic field. So if you have some mode uh, that is there in these uh, which generates a magnetic field or magnetic noise. Just Johnson noise also you can measure. So people, for example, I think Michelle Lukin's group measure Johnson noise inside uh, metallic films using any centers. So not just uh, magnetic structures, but electronic side people can measure. So, so that could be another interesting probe to look at. So I'm not sure I might be out of time. Finish. Yeah, so I'll just maybe finish this last last piece over here. Uh, or since I've talked too much about noise, maybe I should go to the. This one, or this work out here, where. <coughs> so now, so far we were looking at uh, magnets noise. Uh, magnetism also brings in this naturally breaks time reversal symmetry. Right? So as a result of that, you would expect a chiral nature to these, these uh, modes that are there. 
In fact, uh, again, it's very well known in the, in the community that uh, these chiral modes exist. Uh, from 60s, that if you just take a thin film of Vikramar and Barnett, uh, the modes that are there inside these magnets are chiral in the sense that a mode which is propagating on the plus k direction, minus k direction, produces different strength of magnetic fields outside of this material system. And that can be seen uh, very simply by if I just look at the, uh, just write this as a wave over here and apply usual magnetostatic approximations to calculate the magnetic field generated by these waves. You can view these waves as just charges that you, uh, you have in these magnetic structures. And these charges are distinctly, dis uh, on the surface, there's a divergence of magnetization that gives rise to charges. And then there's a wave vector that gives rise to the charges. So if you look at the charges, charge distribution that is generated for plus and minus k, that is very different between each other for these thin magnetic flaps. And so that's a microscopic mechanism of why you have very different kind of magnetic field generated. Now this is interesting because now you can think of creating non-reciprocal circuits with these spin defects. So spin defects again can be thought of as two qubits, which now you're connecting by a magnet. So one of the spin and another spin can be connected with each other. You can cause entanglement between these two spins via a magnon bus. You can also directly couple, they can directly couple by dipolar interaction, but that is very short range. These magnons can propagate very long distance and the slides that I skipped, actually there are calculations that show that these magnons can generate micron scale uh, entanglement between two end cycles. So that is a way that people are thinking forward for creating a scalable network of these spin defects. You can entangle uh, two defects which are micron scale apart. But what we, we were looking at in this work is that it's not just that, it is also non-reciprocal, just because of the fact that uh, the plus K and minus K produces two different kinds of field strengths at the end sector. As a result, you can, one bit propagation, uh, so let's say a left NV coupled with the right NV will be different from right NV coupled with the left NV. And that is an interesting uh, aspect really where people utilize that in the quantum optics community to create uh, chiral quantum optics. One can uh, sort of simulate or create, uh, co copy all those uh, protocols in the microwave domain with these NV-center magnum system. And in order to demonstrate that is what we again use this relaxometry technique to uh, show that uh, indeed there is chiral coupling between these NV-center magnons. And the essential physics here again is, as I just mentioned, magnons produce magnetic fields which are of different strength going forward or backward, which is a different strength of rotating magnetic fields. NV-center also hosts two levels, right? So there's a zero to minus one and zero to plus one. There are two two-level systems, effective two two-level systems one can uh, have in these NV-centers. And these two effective two-level systems have a built-in chirality as well. Uh, so if I look at the, just the Hamiltonian of the system, there's a zero field splitting that exists. That's the zero field splitting between zero and plus minus one, right? And then there is this external magnetic field that you can apply to split them further. So now if this Hamiltonian, if I imagine this as B dot S type of Hamiltonian, there's an effective inbuilt field that comes from this term, which is spin dependent. So depending on whether the spin is up or spin is down, the effective fields felt by these two, uh, two level systems is opposite. And this is what actually has been seen experimentally, that if you come in with a microwave, which is circularly polarized, one way circular polarization connects this level, but the other circular polarization connects the other level. So these transitions are, are dependent on the polarization of the field. So now uh, if we combine the two effects that we just discussed, that the magnet, magnon produces fields which are of different strengths, uh, rotating in each direction of different strength, and each polarization couples differently to different levels. You can see that this way rotating field uh, will couple cause this transition, but the other way rotating field will cause other transition. And since they are of different strengths, the rate of relaxation will be different between uh, the, those, two, those two levels. So by just measuring the relaxation rate of, uh, of NV centers, uh, coming from this uh, between between zero to plus one and zero to minus one, and see that if they are different, when the splitting between these two levels is very tiny, we can prove that the coupling is uh, is it is chiral, and that's exactly the experiment we did uh, with our collaborators. This this time with at TU Delft, where the NV center was placed on top of nickel thin films, and the two rates that I'm showing here are indeed these gamma plus and gamma minus, which you can extract separately because now you can. Uh, initialize in state zero and watch it relax. You can initialize in state minus one, watch it relax. Initialize in state plus one, watch it relax. And then you have a three level model of relaxation rate from which you can extract each of these levels, rates. And that rate is what is plotted here as a function of external magnetic field on these energy centers. And as the external magnetic field goes to zero, that is, there's no energy difference between the two. The two rates go to very different values. And that 
that feature is exactly what was predicted by Ethereum. That sort of shows that this token is indeed tied. So, so that uh, essentially shows that uh, these magnons can potentially be used as mediators of coupling between coin centers, which can give rise to non reciprocal services. Is it possible to create a wave guide of magnons? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so, I kind of skipped those. <coughs> that slide. Really, uh, well, right now, theory, theory experiment, uh, but wave guide has been created experimentally. <coughs> But in this uh, theory paper, what they were calculating was, let me cool this system down and now go into the single magnet regime and see if I can create a coupling between two energy centers, which is greater than the relaxation rate, so that I can have high cooperativity system in the system. And they calculated the cooperativity, uh, the couplings and uh, cooperativity. What is shown as the main feature you can see is this, there's a gray line, where the gray line tells the couplings if these were just coupled by normal dipole-dipole interaction, and that falls off very quickly. On the other hand, if you have, if you engineer the magnon waveguide properly, you can have the coupling survive up to micron scale distances as well. So, so this is something that people are now trying to build you to see if you can entangle two energy centers with magnon bus. All right, now with that, since I'm out of time, I'll just maybe conclude in messages back. Saying that, uh, so now uh, I hope what I've convinced you is that they are these kind of different sectors which people have been looking at. But if we merge them together, there are two main message, two main things that come out of it. One is you can use these MV centers or DPEG centers to actually probe a lot of create novel probes for uh, for advancing this this side of things which were not present earlier. And on the other hand, you can use, for example, magnons that we talked about can be used as novel control fields on chip control fields to. Uh, to drive these energy centers or create entanglement between them, create non-reciprocal circuits out of them. So that's uh, that's the hope that people are trying to achieve now experimentally uh, along this side. Things now, as as was also already brought up by Arindam, I only focused on magnetic systems here, but really this energy center has really emerged as a probe of condensed matter in general, because you can use this for not just magnetic, magnetic uh, structures, but also for things which just generate magnetic fields out of them. And uh, I, I, the next steps that we are currently looking at this quantum science center is trying to use these energy centers on these recently emerging 2D magnets uh, system because there really it is a, a very interesting uh, aspect because the 2D magnets again are uh, have very little cross section of absorption. So then or again traditional probes of magnets become very hard to apply to 2D magnets to see its excitations and things like this. But NV center technique is very sensitive for this. And, uh, and in fact, in a very this is a preliminary data where we are trying we are seeing sort of topological type of textures inside these 2D magnets using these energy centers. You hear the noise of them. Uh, so we are really excited about applying these techniques for these systems. And potentially there's hope that we can even go beyond these sort of conventional magnets, but even quantum magnetic like noise coming from let's say on a spin layer, which is something that is very interesting to explore uh, using these, these techniques. So with that, I'll probably just let you that. Thank you. All uh, right, so so if you have two NV centers, uh, the magnons, there's a coherent coupling mediated by magnons, but at the same time, each of these magnons NV centers are, uh, are decoherent. So decoherence is caused by its intrinsic decoherence. But at the same time, now since this coupled to this magnet system, this sort of double edged sword, right? So then this magnet, magnet system itself, it can be essentially can decode into the magnet system. And if I want to create strong coupling between two, I also increase that channel of decodes. So one has to engineer it properly such that people use these so called off resonance schemes, where you actually, they are not exactly resonant, so you get rid of this relaxation type of technique, but still, this, this person is still coupled to the and that's that is what you have to stay around and see which uh, how much difference you can kill before uh, you can also kill. Just very question regarding if you want to have a sense a cluster of spins uh, using a single uh, diamond, how many? What's the realistic limit of uh, how many spins can be detected? Right, right, right. So. People have used to even detect uh, let's say nuclear spins. 
uh, angle of movement. So that's all possibly the tiniest bit that you could get detected. So you can detect even a single nuclear spin. So a single go magnet. Single go magnet, or you can detect with any spin. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting for more questions. If uh, the online audience has any questions, please ask. So we are talking about NB minus one. Is it possible that you can convert NB zero to NB minus one? As a yeah, yeah, so people do that. So again, I might not be the best person to answer this. Uh, so experimentally, people actually do that. So, so for example, uh, the things that can affect NB minus, if you shine light a lot on it, this minus charge can also be kicked out. And this NB can get converted NB zero, which is a problem. So that limits the amount of power you can shine on these NB minus cycles. So that they can still be NB, uh, they behave as NB minus. I'm sure people will have techniques for converting back also. In fact, people use this technique from NB minus NB zero for reading out the center also. So not optically, but looking at uh, if there's NB minus, they see how they how much current you can extract out of these minus centers. That also depends depends on the band structure, so the spin alignment. And as a result of that, you can detect spin also by this charge conveyor technique. And recently, people are trying to use that as opposed to optics as well. So. So this is quantum hole theorem magnet, right? So there are many phases of this uh, state of background and that. And I have seen people have been using either this steel or single electron points. So why this exercise? Right. But why don't we use this in this Yeah, so that, so that was the hope. So uh, Jacobi's group was trying to do that. So we were trying to see the challenge it becomes is uh, again doing all this at mean cryogenics although i pitched it it can there are this a bit challenging in the sense that uh, if you shine light it sort of heats the system up so then you're restricted uh, what lowers temperature but then but people have ex extended so for example now people can go up to four time and i'm pretty sure so many people sometimes will get that extra bit now now the they are cryogenic also available commercially. Yeah. Cryogenic available. Uh, the only challenge is how much uh, laser power you can use because you will start perturbing your system. Please also. Yeah, that is, that is probably a good <laughs> question. Let's thank Sir Pramir again. Thank you. If we have another talk.